lounge and sun. All right. Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name's Ryan. And with me today, I have one of my all time favorite writers. I have Mr. Marv Wolfman here. I, I mean, I think uh, so much of my collection has so much of your work. So, I mean, there's there's Teen Titans, Batman, Superman, Tomb of Dracula. You created Spider Woman. You created Bullseye. You created, I mean, there's just so much um, yeah. that you've created that I love. And I just want to thank you. you know, thank you so much for joining me today to talk some comics. I'm, I'm happy to be here. So first of all, you know, I always ask you, I, mean, I know for a fact you've probably told this story so many times, but I would just love to hear like either what started your love for comics or what was that first comic that just like ignited that fire in you? Well, uh, I think like a lot of people today, um, back in the 1950s, uh, what happened was I, my friend and I were watching TV. We were watching a show called uh, How Do Duty, which was a very strange show. At any, but at that age, you didn't know, and there wasn't that much um, uh, else that you could have watched uh, back then. At any rate, uh, instead of getting up to change the channel, we kept it on the channel we were watching for a minute, and suddenly a show starts called The Adventures of Superman. We had never heard of it, but that opening looked interesting because he was flying and all that stuff. And we watched the show, and at the end of the show, it said... Uh, uh, Superman was based on the copyrighted character appearing in Superman and Action Comics monthly. And we walked to the corner where there was a newsstand, bought our first comic, and it was Superman. That's amazing. That's so awesome. I mean, that's, you know, every, I think so many uh, people, they, they do have similar stories, whether it's the Superman show, the Batman show, you know, then the younger generation, the animated shows, and now it's, you know, the movies. There's like, it's everywhere, right? So, right. I, I know that you, it, you wanted to be an artist as well, right? You wanted to draw yeah. comics. Yeah, I just I, wasn't that good. <laughs> okay, so you got you went into the writing side. You started at DC first, correct? Or what was yes. your first published work? Uh, it was for House of Mystery, uh, or House of Secrets. I forget which one because uh, I sold them at the same time. At the same time, uh, did an issue of Black Hawk. If if memory serves me correct, from just like. You know, everything I've read about you, you were at DC very briefly before you went to Marvel and then eventually ended up back at DC. Actually, um, I was probably at DC, you know, for a while uh, okay. bec I, because I started in 1967. I didn't get the Marvel stuff until about 70. So two or three years doing short stories for DC. Mm -hmm. Also Teen Titans and a few others as well. So during your time at Marvel, you were not only writing, but you were also an editor. Yes, and how, editor in chief. And editor in chief, exactly. So how does that kind of title differ, and how do you juggle writing comic books as well as editing, and and then you know being an editor in chief? Uh, discipline. Um, I mean, it's a matter of you're doing the editorial work at the office nine to five. The writing was done at night. So I was able to uh, fairly easily uh, combine the two. If memory serves, it's during that time that Marvel overtakes DC as the number one publisher. Is that? Yeah. I think it may have been even a little bit earlier, but yeah, around that time. During your during your time, I think probably one of your, your best known runs at Marvel was Tomb of Dracula. Was Dracula with Gene Colan, by the way. I don't want to like not mention yeah. Gene's name as well, but Gene was the best, and he actually drew every issue of Tomb of Dracula. I came in with issue seven, so he was on it for longer than I was. Was Dracula a favorite character of yours? Like going back to the original Universal, like how did that project come come about? Because that is uh, a long uh, run. Uh, Dracula uh, was as far from a uh, something I wanted as you can get. I have never seen a Dracula movie. Even to this day, I've never seen a Dracula movie. I've never seen most of that stuff with vampires. I was not at all interested in that. But what happened was I was looking for uh, a, a book, and there were two books available. One was Doctor Strange and one was Tomb of Dracula. But the editor, uh, Roy Thomas, who was the editor-in-chief at the time, uh, really felt that I would be better on Dracula. Uh, so I... Um, now, I had read the book, 
the original novel, and the novel is excellent. It, it's it's about the people who Dracula confronts a lot more than just about Dracula. So uh, he assigned me to Dracula. I, I really love the books and uh, found a way of doing it in comics that I thought would be good. And uh, the rest was history. I mean, yeah, I think it's, it, do you think maybe because like the outside stuff besides the novel, do you think that that enabled you to kind of do your own spin without having too much outside thing in influencing the version of Dracula that you portrayed? Well, I think, because I've never seen, as I say, a, a Dracula movie. I've never read Dracula, uh, except for the original novel, anything connected with Dracula. I think that allowed me to do what I felt was the right way. And uh, Dracula, uh, there had never been in the history of comics a continued horror series. Nobody had ever done one. What they've done, were all the uh, horror books were short eight-page stories, seven-page stories, something like that. But no one did a continued series until Dracula. So there was nothing to follow. There was nothing for me to get any clues how to do it. I had to come up with my own. And being forced to come up with my own ideas, I think, is what made the book as good as uh, good as it was. And was that the period, like, because I know that prior to that, I know that the Comics Code Authority, when you go from, like, the EC Comics, then the code comes out. But then, and there's, like, no mo- no you're not allowed to depict monsters and stuff. So was that kind of when the the it started the rain started to be loosened? Is that why Dracula was able to be produced at the yes. moment it was? Yeah. Uh, uh, for the longest time, vampires could not appear in comics because of the comics code. So once they were, uh, as I said before, I was involved with Dracula. Marvel started to do different horror books, and then they called me in because I had been doing a lot of those horror stories. Uh, for DC and Marvel, the short eight pages, but I've never, I had never done a series until Roy Thomas uh, gave me the, uh, gave me Tomb of Dracula. Your ending to Tomb of Dracula, I've heard that there were supposed to be two more issues. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and um, having to, because I, I know it ends at 70. How and why did it have to wrap up in that, in that way? Originally, there were three issues uh, that were left. Okay. I, the editor in chief at that time, uh, Jim Shooter, wanted uh, to cancel the book right away. I convinced him not to. We he gave me two issues to wrap it up in, which was the double sized book, which meant about fourteen pages of work that Gene and I did would never see print. So I had to write around that because I still had to get that same information across. You can see the most of those pages. I don't know. It shouldn't be confusing. In one of the uh, Tomb of Dracula uh, omnibuses, they I loaned them a copy of all that artwork and they printed it. So you can see almost every page that was missing. There's no lettering. Uh, it's not. You you can't see the story. But I had to co- I had to make it work three issues worth of stuff into one double sized book and had to figure out how to, how to make that work because the pages now were no longer in order anymore. And you also created blade during that amazing run. And that character has, I mean, grown to have a complete life of its own movies, right? Like they're going to make a new movie TV show. Um, where did that idea come from blade? Was that all you? Was that brainstorming with Gene, like coming up with the look and stuff like that? Mm-hmm. How did that character come about? It was one of those weird things. The story came, uh, the entire story of blade came to me literally in one second. I was walking home and um, suddenly this idea came. I do, I'm not sure quite why it just, I was, I knew that I was about to do Tomb of Dracula um because i was told i'd be doing it so it must have been my mind must have been thinking about this but i i wasn't specifically thinking about it it's just that all of blade came to me in about a second that's great that's crazy so you also did fantastic four you also did spider woman and stuff like that when do you decide to kind of make the move back to dc i didn't get i really didn't get along with the editor-in-chief and uh it was better uh to just leave and it's i think it's around that time is that that's when you and george perez uh 
do Teen Titans, right? That's like basically well, at the same time. No, well, it is only in the sense that I was able to do two of drag. I mean, um, Teen Titans because I left Marvel. So in uh, December of 1979, I quit Marvel, and in January of '80, I started at DC. And you go on to, I mean. Teen Titans is is where I first discovered. You know, Teen Titans has always been a favorite title of mine. I've read, I've read those comics like so many different ways: single issues, omnibus, trade paperback. Um, it's definitely probably the high water mark for me in terms of like how much I love your stuff. And you know, it's, oh, thank you. And then just you and George just together, like, I mean, it's lightning in a bottle what you guys create. Yeah. I mean, just some of the best work both of you created was together in my opinion we got um, we got along real well we were friends mm -hmm. and we saw comics pretty much in the same way you not only take over this team who i think at that prior to that had kind of been floundering not really a big well, sales juggernaut and you created a juggernaut with team titans i mean it was one of the books of the 80s just going well, back in my history and learning about the book it. uh the book was canceled the previous version of Teen Titans was canceled less than a year before. Mm -hmm. And I came in wanting to do it because I had done some Teen Titans work back in the 70s, or actually late 60s. It just, it it was lightning in a bottle, as you said. Uh, the two of us didn't think it was going to sell because DC wasn't very successful at that particular point with sales. So what we decided to do was we figured it would last six issues, seven issues. We were going to do it though, the way, absolutely the way we always wanted to see a superhero comic done. Mm -hmm. So uh, since we, since nobody was paying attention to it, since everybody thought it was going to be canceled right away, uh, we were allowed to do exactly what we wanted and it worked out. And what was the decision <laughs> behind, like, I mean, you take the core, right, of the team, Speedy's not a part of it at first, though. It's just, you know, you got Robin, you got uh, Wonder Girl, and you got Kid Flash to begin with, but then it's new characters. So what was the thought behind introducing half of a new team of no, nobody had, like, there's no history to them? And then how much of that was like, uh, again, the was that you and George coming up with those characters together? The basic reason for doing it is I didn't want to. I didn't want the Teen Titans just to look exactly the way the previously canceled book looked. Okay. I didn't want all those. Robin was a great addition because he was always a leader type. Wonder Girl I really liked because I originally named her Donna Troy back in um, uh, the seventies, early seventies. So the whole idea was to make the book look fresh but familiar at the same time, and. Um, it worked out really well. Uh, we were able to do original stories using some of those characters and just age them up a bit. In the original, I think they were about 10, 11, or 12. And in ours, they were 17, 18, 19. You know, so that allowed us to do a lot of stories. Also, I got rid of things like Mr. Jupiter because I did not want any adults in the book telling them what to do. They were old enough to do everything on their own. And I didn't want an adult coming in and giving them orders. So that's why we got rid of all of that. Yeah, I think one of the things that, you know, always stood out to me too about Teen Titans is, the, especially what makes them different from Justice League is, is the, the family dynamic. You know, like they hang out with each other where yeah. you don't really, I mean, Justice League, you know, they go, they fight crime, boom, they're done. And I didn't away. want, I didn't want, that was the big difference even in my sales pitch to get it sold. I didn't want just a bunch of characters getting together. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be a family book. And that was absolutely vital to me. And that was my main uh, thrust and interest in doing it. When did you guys know the book was a hit? How, cause I, I mean like numbers now are like pretty much instantaneous. You can get them immediately. When did you guys know that, okay, we have more than the six or seven issues that we thought we might have? Well, actually it took about six issues to get the sales figures from the first issue. Okay. So it really sold incredibly well. Then the next issue went down in sales, issue two. Issue three went further down. Issue four went down. And then what happened was 
issue five and six were the reaction to issue one. It finally came because nobody had, nobody could have figured out the sales figures at that particular point. So issues five and six actually had the showing that it was growing and suddenly it took off. So with issue six, we knew that the book was a hit. And then, how, so now that you know it's a hit and you can like kind of do long form planning out, one of my favorite storylines is the Judas contract. Like by far. Everybody says that. I I love that story. Plus you also change Robin to Nightwing, give him his kind of own identity, you know, like yeah. to show that he's matured, which I mean, Nightwing's probably, he's right there, top three favorite DC characters. So um, I just love that storyline. But how long of that was like kind of planned out? introducing Tara kind of in the background and kind of moving all these chess pieces around before you drop the hammer of her being a spy and working for Deathstroke. Obviously it was before we introduced her. Uh, I mean, that's obvious. I would probably say, cause I was plotting two, three, four years ahead of time. I, uh, when I pitched the idea to George saying, here's what I want to do for the next year or two, we wanted to establish her as a hero in the beginning, even though the very first time you see her, she's trying to destroy things. And But in comics, the bad girl always becomes the good girl, and we knew that. Uh, and we were playing off the idea that the fans would think that was what we were doing. Because Kitty Pride had just come into X-Men, and she was going to be the good girl. She was going to be the great. And, my whole thing was, what if she's not? Why does she have to be? Let's do something different. Let's do something completely unexpected because all the fans are going to just assume that at some point she's going to become the good girl. The hardest thing for us was to make sure we never fell in love with her and decided to change our mind. We did. We knew she had to die. We knew how she had to die. We knew why she had to die. We knew that she was insane. And the fans all thought it was just, just, you know, things that we threw in to keep the storyline going. And then when it, then when we finally revealed that it was true, that she was not going to be redeemed, they went crazy. Yeah, you know, I can only imagine the way the fandom is going. Because, like, you're trying to not fall in love with the character while the fans are falling in love with this character. Well, that was the whole idea. We had to make it that they fell in love with her, not us. Yeah. Because the thing we didn't want to do is say, we love this character so much, let's turn her good. We knew from day one that could never happen. It had to be that she was not only bad, she was really bad. She was insane bad. Having written Teen Titans, I think you wrote it, uh, I want to say 15? Is that a, a correct number, close to it, 15 years? Oh. Um, Consecutively, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was a little bit long. I think it was 17 years. I'm, okay. I'm not sure. I'm not positive uh, at this particular point. I used to know it, but I'm not positive right now. Okay. What uh, Out of all those years, what were some of the your favorite storylines? Was there anything you wanted to do but weren't allowed to do it or didn't get a chance to do? Uh, there was never anything that I was not allowed to do. Uh, I was allowed to do anything I wanted with it. It was DC's best-selling book. Uh, and they weren't going, even when the sales started to fall, they let me do it the way I felt that it should be done. What was the rest? I forget. Oh, well, like what were some of your, maybe two, three favorite storylines that you, that you were. Uh, okay. One of them, which is almost never mentioned. In fact, probably never mentioned was a story called, uh, a pretty girl is like a malady, uh, it was with the original Starfire, the Russian character that, that we had created, that I had, I had co-created back in 70, whatever year that story came out. That's one of my absolute favorite Titan story of all. Um, another one that people don't ever talk about was um, the issue where Changeling and Deathstroke have a sit down at the diner and talk for the talk for almost the entire book. I thought that was a real solid story because Changeling did not really want to kill. She was he was just angry, so angry at being taken advantage of of falling for this person, but he's not a bad he's a good guy. So when the story was always done as if there was going to be a big fight scene, but then they just decide no, let's just talk. 
And when you create, like you're t- talking about Deathstroke, when coming up with that character, was that kind of your intention to make him this like recurring, like arch nemesis of the team? When you're creating characters, you have no idea how it's going to be perceived. You have no idea if people are going to like the character or not. I knew and George knew that Deathstroke was a really good character, Mm -hmm. but that didn't mean the fans were going to love him. So, you know, I can't say I expected he's going to be there all the time. But once we once we established it in the second issue and we knew we knew how good he was. And we knew the costume looked great. And we knew all that sort of stuff. And I had already worked out the entire history of the character. At that point, we knew that he'd be back. But when we first created it, no. And during your tenure on Teen Titans, you you kicked off one of, I think, if not the gold standard for crossovers with Crisis on Infinite Earths. Um, you and George together teaming up again. How did that project come about? And like, what was it like working on such an expansive, so many characters consolidating how many, I mean, all those years of history, multiple Earths into one cohesive universe. And then you also wrote the history of the DC universe yeah. as well. So, you know, uh, I've told the story so many times, but essentially a fan wrote in saying DC continuity was all confusing. Uh, based on that letter, I actually said, we need to do something about that. And I came up with the storyline pretty much very quickly, or the concept very quickly, got it approved like a day or two later. And then it took a couple of years actually to work out the entire story because you had one chance to do this. If you're gonna change if you're gonna change the DC universe, if you're going to uh do, you know, make it different. You had to make sure everything worked. You had to make sure that it was going to be perfect, that you couldn't have done anything else with it. So it took a couple of years to come up with that because I wanted to make sure every T was crossed, every I was dotted, and that the, that the story would do what it needed to do. And that wasn't easy, which is why it took that long. As for dealing with all the characters, I knew them inside and out, so they were already firmly in my head. It's the plot that took all the time. I knew how the characters would react, but it was the plot that had to work absolutely correctly. There was no room for failure or DC could have been in trouble. Mm -hmm. And do you find it ironic that back then you guys got a letter saying that they didn't understand it was confusing. And now everybody knows what a multiverse is like the, the, you know, the public knows because of the movies and they kind of just accept it. Okay. This is a different version, you know? How funny, yes. like, do you ever sit and think about that? How, like, back then they couldn't wrap their heads around Well, you think now. of the Academy Award winner for last year was the was the uh, Chinese movie uh, all about multiverses. Mm-hmm. So um, when we did it, peop- if you weren't a loyal DC fan, you had no idea what a multiverse was because Marvel didn't have them back then. Mm-hmm. So... It all had to be written so that the Marvel fans, because we already had the DC fans, they were buying, we knew they would be buying the book because they were buying DC books, but the Marvel readers would not come over to DC. They just weren't interested in it. And this book had to reach out and be very clear as to what it was. Because again, a lot of the Marvel fans just found the DC multiverse very complicated at the time. If you were a DC fan, no, you understood it because you grew up with it. But if you were a Marvel fan, you didn't understand why there were two Supermans or three Flashes or whatever it else. So this story had to be really clear to tell the story to people who had never looked at a DC comic before. It were in, in the deaths in there and the weight that they held, you know, in that series. I mean, I've heard like, you know, another series where, you know, the sequel to Crisis with Infinite Crisis, Superboy dies in there, but it was really the editorial wanted somebody else. Was that ever a factor in terms of when you guys were deciding in Crisis on Infinite Earth, like Barry Allen dies, Supergirl dies? Like, how did you guys figure out like which superhero deaths you were going to? Well, DC have? was the one who came up with the idea that Flash should die. I I created the list of all the other characters that I that story-wise would make sense to uh to kill. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't going to kill him just to kill a character. It had to make total sense story-wise and character-wise that that, ca that character's death was going to resonate into the new universe that we were creating. And, you know, moving after, you know, I mean, you're still writing Teen Titans at this time, but you take on another one of my favorite storylines with Batman Year Three. You introduce the new Robin, Tim Drake, who also one of my, I mean, also one of my favorite characters. I mean, his ongoing, I, I used to love reading his, his solo adventures, but you introduce a Robin that is unlike the two prior. There's no yeah. real, there's nothing, no hardship, right? There's no death in his family. He's just wanting to help and yeah. save Batman from himself. Brilliant idea. Um, where did the idea for you kind of come from and why create a new Robin? There are several different questions in that one. Essentially, uh, we were using, of course, Robin and the Teen Titans, uh, the Dick Grayson Robin and the Teen Titans. And the Batman editor, Danny O'Neill, wanted to have Robin back into Batman. Um, and they asked me because I was controlling them uh, uh, in the Teen Titans, but he really wanted it. And I sat there and went, I actually don't care about Robin. I care about Dick Grayson. I care about that character. Also, in my mind, because of what we were doing in the Teen Titans, Robin was now 18 or 19 years old. And those stupid green little swimsuit that he was wearing was ridiculous. <laughs> you, it works when you're 12 back in 1940. It didn't work in 1985 when the character is like 18 or 19. So I said, how about you take Robin? Let me let me keep Dick Grayson. First of all, that would allow me to maintain continuity with the Titans. Plus, it would do something that had never been done in the history of comics, letting the partner graduate to become a major character on their own. Mm -hmm. That was important. It was just, then you can actually make it a big thing that Batman is going to get a new Robin in a sense. Now, my view was that we've seen every character, you know, become that hero because they're, they're somebody dies and we just see it as a one note. It's the same. Why make this new character exactly the same as the old character? Why do that? That's ridiculous. So the, my feeling was this character had to want to become Robin for a completely different way and the thing that ran through my head was that if all the other characters became the partner because of uh, a death or something of that sort, this character cannot be that. This character has to want to be the character. He he figures out who Robin is, which means he figures out who uh, Dick Grayson and uh, Dick Grayson is. He's a hero type. He's good. All of that sort of stuff was to make him a unique character and have a positive input. Now, part of the reason he's a positive character is that, again, the there was no, um, no deaths in there, but the original Batman became a very angry character because his parents died and it took him an entire lifetime to find Joey Chill who, who killed him. So he had a lifetime of anger building up inside him because he could never find the, the guy who kills his parents. Robin, on the other hand, Dick Grayson, on the other hand, his parents die. And within a day, Batman finds their, killer, his, their killers. So Robin never, Dick Grayson never had time to brood over this. He was rescued. And that's the whole thing that is my version of Robin. He's a character who helps other people. He's the character who makes, you know, wants to go out and solve problems and help people because he he never felt the death in his family uh, was, gone, was, was solved right away. And then he was brought into Bruce Wayne's home and he was brought into this great place. So he had no angst and no anger and that was that was vitally important mm -hmm. uh, to, to be different from what uh, every Robin that had proceeded before. And in terms of you know 
your the characters you've created so many of them have been adapted and i know that you've been heavily involved whether it's a titan show or i know you you worked a little bit on the christ of earth's arrowverse crossover too yeah. what is it like to see these characters that have lived inside your head be brought to life on this small screen on the big screen you know, first of all, I have no negatives on the issue whatsoever. Uh, my only thing is, are you doing it well? Mm-hmm. Are you being honest to the characters? I don't care where you take them in many places, but be honest to the characters as we did. The reasoning behind the characters should make sense. And to me, if you do that, do a great job. Have fun. And in terms of like writing comic books, um, you have a new one out this week. The What If Dark Tomb of Dracula. Yes, right. I got a chance I to can't. read it. Yeah, it's blurring out, but I'll, I'll throw you, it up on the screen you, for people to look at. Okay, you've read it? I've read it, yes. How? Well, It doesn't come out till Wednesday. Well, I I used to work at a comic book store, and uh, I, can, I they let me get my books early. So I was able to grab one. I said I, I, I needed to read it because I was going to talk to you. So I wanted to be able to know what happened in the book um i loved it it was awesome i love i love seeing the original creators that worked on old books and then you get to see them revisit how did the project come about did you reach out to them with the idea Did editorial reach out to you um and what was it like revisiting this world after such a long time i hadn't really except for once 10 page story i hadn't worked for marvel since 1980 uh, so, no, there was no way I was going to be calling them. I mean, this was Marvel, They uh, because we had some legal problems, so they weren't going to use me at all. So I would never have even thought to um, uh, call them. I didn't even know that What If was still being done. Uh, they called me, asked me to do it, and essentially made it clear that what I wanted to do is what they wanted to do, that they would not be telling me how to handle it. The only thing they asked was uh, Dracula and Blade. And everything else had to be, was my, was what I came up with. And uh, so they called me, they asked me, I submitted a plot, they liked the plot, um, and then I wrote it. You know, I'm glad you liked it. Uh, There's only been one other comment on, of some from somebody who read it so it's nice to hear that it was like because i you worry about it since dracula itself tomb of dracula was such a um special book in many ways for so many people especially me but the fans really loved it in ways i was not even aware because we didn't get that many that much mail back then so i didn't know that how much the fans liked it until all the stuff that's on the net right now uh, so I'm really pleased and I ho- I'm glad that you liked it. Was there anything special that you liked uh, uh, what, any, any without giving away anything? Well, first of all, I love what ifs. I love getting to see a different spin on characters. And I think that, you know, like that's what I love about DC Elseworlds, you know? So whenever I get a chance to get an Elseworlds or a what if, I usually pick, I usually pick it up. Not always, but this one, I was like, oh man, I'm really excited about it. And then I knew we were going to be talking. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. We're talking the week it comes out. I loved your spin on, you know, the the change of like what you do with Blade. I mean, I think it's in the solicit. So Blade becoming a vampire, right? Like they advertised that. I love that. I think the art was fantastic. And I just like, I've read a little bit of Tomb of Dracula. I don't have a lot. I did recently go go order a bunch um, for myself. Because some of it's out of print. It's not always accessible. And I won't read digitally. That's something I just, I can't do. I want the book in my hand. It's how it was meant to be read. But yeah, I just think it was such a phenomenal job and getting to see, I really like what Blade does to Dracula. I like I like how after he gets bit, um, kind of turning it on its head. I think- Don't I say anything more. Yeah. I... But f- fantastic. Um, was this, I, I guess what I wanted to ask you uh, while we're talking about it is, was this an idea that you had had before or was this something that you just worked up for the for the title? I wouldn't have wasted my time coming up with an idea for something that I was not going to write. And I knew and as I say I hadn't worked for Marvel since 1980, so yeah. there was no assumption. No, they called me and I went 
where can I, the main thing was where does this fit into continuity that I could twist it at that point? Mm -hmm. That that thing of turning on road B instead of A, uh, which is what uh, uh, which is what a uh, what if story is about. Here's the way it went. Now he's going to turn and go that way. Uh, that was the hardest part. Uh, but no, I came up with the story just because I had the assignment. I really don't. I really don't take a lot of time to think about stuff that I'm actually not assigned to do. You know, now that you like you said, you haven't worked for Marvel in a long time. Is there any chance of maybe you wanting to do some more stuff with Marvel? If they're interested and it's the right book, I don't want to do stuff uh, that I don't feel um, prepared to do. Mm -hmm. I haven't read a, a lot of Marvels lately, so I wouldn't want to take on a book where I don't know what they've done for the last 30 years. So it has to be something that I feel that I could confidently write the correctly as opposed to just coming in for an assignment and to make a couple of bucks, I could do that doing something else. So, so we'll see. Okay, cool. Well, I'm, I'm here for all of it. So what, what else are you working on? Is there any other comic book work that you're currently yeah. working on that you can talk about? Um, I'm, uh, I'm doing a graphic novel, um, an original. So one that I'll, I will own. I mean, we already have a publisher and I'm on page 50 of it now. And it'll be, I don't know, about 150 to 200 pages. And I'm really happy with what I've done so far. I, I really like it. And do you have a time frame of when that may we may get some announcements on that? No, it's partially because it's something that I own. I want to make sure it works. Okay. So it will it will be done when it's done. Hopefully sooner than later. All right. I'm very, very excited for that. Um, any any. DC stuff in the works for you or just the creator owned is taking up all your time right now? Uh, I've had to turn down a lot of work because I, I don't want anything but to work on the, on the creator owned job right now. It's, I have to make that work correctly. Okay. Uh, and what's a typical day like for you? And like, when you're, when you're writing, like how, how well, coming up with a story too, like um, what's, what's the, from the first step to the, you know, to the page. It's a matter of, what the project is, how plugged in I am to the project. The first thing that I always have to do is, what is the reason for the story? Why am I doing this particular story? And since I tend to write character-driven stories as opposed to action-driven stories, how does this affect the character? How does this impact on the character? And that will take as long as it needs to. Uh, because it has to work, otherwise I can't write it. Mm -hmm. If I try to write something that doesn't make sense to me, I will fail. And I failed all the time when I do those. So I have to make sure it works from day one. And then it's a matter of developing that concept. I don't write as fast as I used to. I used to be able to write multiple books a month, and I can't quite do that anymore. You know, as I say, it takes as long as it takes I've asked Marvel when I did the Dracula, because they asked me to do it a, a couple months earlier. And I said, I can't. I'm busy right now and I won't be, won't even be available until I finish this project, mm -hmm. you know, Project X. And they very kindly rescheduled mine so I could finish one, because I can't do two at the same time anymore. So they were really nice and uh, pushed the deadline back on me. To, so that I could do it um, and make it work uh, with all the limitations that I put on top of it. I, I do want to ask to, uh, you know, as we wrap up, you know, last, last year we lost, we lost George. Right. Um, and I think the whole comic book world was extremely sad. And I can only imagine as you know, you guys being as close as you were and how that would affect you. But I was wondering if you could maybe share like one of your favorite uh, stories with George. Well, I think, I think, the thing about George was as brilliant as he was an artist, he was even more so as a person. We never had an argument or a difference of opinion all the years we worked together. One of the things that made that work was that we decided pretty much from day one that if one of us objects to a plot line or an approach, we'll just get rid of it. We're not going to spend our time arguing back and forth. It's easy to come up with a brand new idea that we both like because we're both very 
plot driven. So we can do that. That way, if I came up with something George didn't like, rather than fight it, I'll go, okay, let's change it. If he did the same same thing there, that way we never fought. That way we never had a problem. All we were concerned about from day one was the story. We put our own little egos aside. And I don't think George had a strong ego like that because he, he, he was such a good person. I mean, so amazing. I think just knowing that both sides were willing to 100% work with each other rather than it has to be my way or else. It's my way or the highway. No, no. Uh, the reason Teen Times worked as well as did in the later crisis is that we agreed on every single step we uh, along the way. I think that's amazing to hear. And I think that, you know, so often you can see when, you know, egos clash, you know, especially when, when things are really good, you know, like everybody's like, well, I'm the reason it's that good or I'm the reason it's that good, you know, and to hear that no matter what you guys didn't allow that to affect your working relationship, your friendship. Yeah. And it is why there's so much magic in those pages and why you can feel it when you read it and there's heart and right. there's joy and there's love. So um, yeah. I just want to thank you so much for uh, creating those comic books together because they're you my know, pleasure. Some of my favorite. My pleasure. Uh, so before I let you go, I was wondering if you could, you know, share with us um, any last thoughts or, you know, even what you're currently reading that that you uh would recommend well i've been uh, really enjoying a lot of the stuff that tom king does his adam strange and his supergirl and a whole bunch of those i thought they were really a wonderful step forward in storytelling i really like them a lot mm -hmm. and any last thoughts on on the project you're working on no i generally don't talk about the stuff until it's ready to go because uh, that takes up time and brain power and I don't have a lot of either of those. So <laughs> it's much better. I'll talk about it like uh, even though I did dra the Dracula thing back, you know, back in time uh, because it had to be written. It had to be. Uh, I didn't talk about it until it was ready to come out. So I generally don't talk about stuff until it's ready to come out. OK, well, I'll be here ready to talk to you when, when you are ready to talk about it. I'm very excited for the project. Everybody awesome. listening and watching. Go pick up the Tomb of Dracula book. You will not be disappointed. And Marv, I just want to thank you again so much for taking time out of your schedule to hang with me and talk some comic books. And My I pleasure. would love to do it with you again sometime. You take care.